If you're happy with the same old ways of dating, if you enjoy sucking at communication, and you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out-of-the-box ideas to deepen your current relationships, broaden your sexual horizons, develop a better understanding of yourself, or learn more about non-monogamy, then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. On this episode of the Multi-Amory Podcast, we're talking about being a secondary while still putting yourself first. So any of you who've listened to us a lot know that normally at Multi-Amory, we are not the biggest fans of hierarchical relationships, meaning having primaries and secondaries. But at the same time, we understand that this is still a very common thing within the poly community. And there are some things that you can definitely do being a secondary partner to someone who is in a hierarchical relationship, or if you are a secondary who's dating a couple. There are things that you can do to help take care of yourself, and that those relationships can be good. Uh, And so that's what we're going to go through today on this episode. Yeah, so to kind of kick things off, first let's talk about that terminology, primary, secondary, in the first place. Mm -hmm. Um, You may be a quote-unquote secondary partner and that's very clear to you you know that's been very clearly labeled to you you know maybe you started dating somebody who said well i have my primary partner so and so and so you know that means that you're my secondary partner and so maybe that's very very clear or Or it may be yeah yeah or they're Mm -hmm. you know maybe they're married to somebody or having kids with somebody something like that or it may be less clear you know this person may not have a primary partner or multiple people that they call primary partners but those relationships are still very intense very much entwined with their life and you're kind of the newbie coming along trying to figure out how to fit into this um Mm -hmm. so that can roughly be divided into kind of two broad categories you know we refer to hierarchy either as prescriptive hierarchy, which is kind of the first type that I described where it's, you know, I decide very clearly this person's going to be my primary partner. They're going to be the most important relationship. You know, maybe that's going to be the only relationship where I choose to cohabit or choose to get married or choose to have kids or choose to run a business together, you know, whatever. And then everyone else is prescribed as secondary Mm -hmm. versus a descriptive hierarchy, which tends to have a little bit more wiggle room you know maybe i won't specifically say this person is my primary partner but maybe i am in a relationship that does appear to be very primary you know i'm living with someone or i'm sharing finances with someone um or maybe that could be a couple relationships that are very primary in that way but anyone new coming to this um obviously is a newbie (laughs) you know Mm -hmm. they don't hop right into sharing finances with me or making major life decisions with me. Um, So for most of this episode, we are going to be talking about that prescriptive hierarchy where it is very clear, you know, this partner is the primary partner and this partner is the secondary partner or all these partners are secondary partners. Um, And as Jay said, the intro, you know, normally we're not very supportive of very strict prescriptive hierarchy. Mm -hmm. However, you know, there are a lot of people who end up in these relationships, you know, people who start dating a couple or who do fall in love with someone who already has a primary relationship. And so we kind of wanted to dig into the ways to be a secondary, quote unquote, secondary partner without, I don't know, without getting screwed, I guess, (laughs) (laughs) without getting walked over, all over. Right. I mean, we understand that human emotion is a really unpredictable thing. And, um, You can even, you know, go into these relationships with your eyes wide open and think that you know exactly where it's going to be headed. Um, But things can happen and there's a lot of potential problems and potential pitfalls um, and also maybe potential awesome things that could happen within this. So we're going to kind of explore and discuss that more right now. Yeah. So on that note, um, we're going to go into some potentially preventative medicine. So what (laughs) can we tell a secondary to help? prepare them for whatever may lie ahead on their journey. Well, lots of vitamins, first of all. (laughs) Some oregano oil. Um, Make sure that they're hydrating. (laughs) Hydrate a lot, for sure. Okay, seriously, though. Seriously, though. What this is about is how can you evaluate when going into a relationship 
what's what's going to be safer versus less safe and we're not yeah. talking about physical safety in this case we're talking about emotional safety we're talking about mm -hmm. how do you determine what sorts of relationships even if they do have a clearly defined primary that's not you what are some things you can try to suss out before getting too involved in that relationship to see if that's something that you could feel secure in in you know, letting yourself get attached to, letting yourself have feelings about it. Yeah, something I want to point out is just the fact that, you know, in voluntarily becoming, choosing to be a secondary partner, like that is a very vulnerable position to put yourself in. Um, potentially, yeah. Yeah, potentially. I mean, for some people, it's so vulnerable that they will entirely choose not to ever, you know, put themselves in that situation where they're very clearly secondary. Other people, not so much. And so that's why we wanted to bring to you some advice on like, you know, if you're going to put yourself in this vulnerable situation, what's probably the best possible scenario to look for um, so that you can still mm -hmm. be safe? Um, you know, things that I tell people to look for, you know, if they started dating somebody who has a primary partner or if they're interested in being part of a triad. But usually this comes up if they if they kind of start dating somebody who already has a primary mm -hmm. um, Kind of a red flag to look for is see if your relationship with this person is predicated on you eventually being with both people. Um, you know, this happens a lot with couples who are seeking triads, you mm -hmm. know, where they kind of assume that like th there's no freedom for one person to date outside of the relationship. It's kind of like, well, you got to date both of us or you can date none of us. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Almost and triads are poly fidelitas. Yes. And triads are their own thing. But just kind of be wary if someone comes to you and says, oh, yeah, I'm Polly," but kind of the implication is that by dating them, eventually you're going to start dating the other person. And yeah. that may happen organically. But again, just kind of be on the lookout if there's an assumption that like that is going to happen or that yeah. that has to happen in order for you to have a relationship with this person. And a second thing to go along with that is that say you do get into this relationship because you are interested in both of them. Maybe that's what mm -hmm. attracted you to it in the first place. So then the next thing I would say to to be aware of is to just be sure that you actually understand what it is that they're expecting from you. Something that mm. comes up a lot in the world of, quote, unicorn hunting, uh, which is where a couple is looking for a bisexual woman to date both of them, that a lot of times part of that goes with it, the <coughs> assumption that this girl that they're both going to date isn't going to date anyone else. Uh, so she's yeah. not really truly going to be an active equal part of their relationship, but they also expect her not to date anyone else. And that's a situation that it's important to be aware that a lot of people may be thinking that way, even unconsciously. Mm. They might not realize that how unfair that is or that that's really what they're looking for. So I would say if you're going into it as a poly person, being sure it's, it's clear to them like, hey, I'm also dating other people and I'm going to keep doing that. Uh, yeah. Just to, to be clear about that up front. Again, like try to get as much of this information as you can in the beginning. And also be sure to be really clear with yourself about what kind of expectations you want to put on the relationship. Um, I mean, a lot of great secondary relationships could come, say, like someone just got out of a very long term, very like emotionally draining relationship and just decide like, hey, I just kind of want to play the field for a while, like be polyamorous, have fun, enjoy the company of somebody who's already in a relationship. Um, mm -hmm. If you know that you're seeking something casual and aren't going to be looking for something more than that, then that's a great way to potentially start a secondary relationship. Um, but if you know that like there's a potential that you may want it to kind of grow and flourish, then that's another thing that you need to look into and understand that potentially there can be mishaps that would go along with that, especially if your uh, primary the person in the primary relationship is expecting you to just be one specific thing and nothing more mm -hmm. than that so right well we the three of us got into kind of a big argument debate about this leading into this <laughs> episode actually um is that is kind of is it reasonable to even think that you could understand what you're going to want from this relationship yeah. Right? Like, mm -hmm. I might want that right now, but how do I know what I'll want later on? And then, you know, mm -hmm. couldn't you apply that to any relationship? And, and you know, there's there's a sort of a lot of questions there, and we kind of went around in circles about it. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. I, but I feel like 
some things like l- let's talk about some ways like some things that you can look for in this couple or in this person to try to make it so even if things do change later on to try to make that a little bit less painful than it could be if it's very strictly you, you're only allowed to be this in our relationship and if either one of us thinks that's out of line then boom you're gone right well, I think that's actually a really good segue to our next point, which is um, it's really important, you know, even before beginning a relationship or in the first stages of beginning this relationship to really don't be afraid to ask questions to yeah. figure out what are the rule, the, the standing rules and agreements mm-hmm. that, you know, are in this primary relationship, um, especially, you know, what are the rules and agreements that are going to apply to you? Yeah. And these can run a whole range. You know, some couples may have veto power, which means that, you know, if one person decides that you're threatening or that, you know, they don't want you around, that they can veto you and that, you know, their partner has to break up with you. Or it could be something, you know, like Jace was dating someone, you know, where there was like a limited, uh, like a specific number of nights per week mm-hmm. that the primary couple had to spend together, you know, so it might be like, well, we need to spend at least three nights together per week. It could be things around like, you know, don't introduce any of your other partners to your parents or to your coworkers. Mm. Um, or mm. major holidays it, it, or, you know, sure. um, or any yeah. any range of agreements, not all bad agreements. They could be, you know, good mm-hmm. ones as well. But it's really important for you to find out, you know, what are the things that do apply to me so that you can get as much information early on in order to be able to make a decision. And again, yeah. keeping in mind that, you know, for instance, if a couple says like, well, we need to spend at least five nights a week together, for instance. Um, when you're starting a relationship, you, may like, you might be like, yeah, sure, whatever, that's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm really busy. We only see each other one night a week anyway. But down the road, that may change. You know, if mm-hmm. you fall in love with this person, you realize, you know what, one night a week actually is not enough. I kind of want to spend more. Then there may be either time for, you know, discussion and renegotiation or not <laughs> essentially there's a possibility yeah. that that may not be available to you well yeah I, I think that's that's the part that i was hoping that we could get to with my question before is just that the that understanding what these rules and agreements are and what you're looking for and what they're looking for all those things but also like how how can we evaluate to see if this is a situation where as things change like they always do in life in one way or another, that it's something that can be an ongoing discussion and isn't something that's yeah. going to get unilaterally decided by somebody else and just passed on to you. Um, mm. That's so, so, I mean, it's easy to say like, yeah, just look for, for, for people or couples that are communicative like that. But <laughs> uh-huh. I think in our example of you're dating someone where you're just dating one person who's in a primary relationship with somebody else, I think part of that is really just asking it outright. Like, is this something that's that can be an ongoing discussion? Like, I'm totally fine with all these things you said, but I just want to know we can talk about it, even if we still end up back where we started. Just the fact that it can be Mm -hmm. a conversation with all of us. But then also, I would say this is a a very important time to reach out to that metamor, reach out to that other person, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I would say a big red flag for me would be if I was dating someone who is in a primary relationship with someone else, and I was like, oh, I'd like to open up communication with them or like be able to talk to them at least. And they're like, oh no, like they don't want to meet you or I don't yeah, want you yeah, to meet them. Yeah, a shitty situation to be yeah, in. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a big and, red flag. But yeah, yeah exactly. Also, like what's underlying that is a big problem. Mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead, Emily. Well, no, just that it, 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 I think it's really crucial and important to look at potential past behaviors within relationships like this. Mm-hmm. Like say the people that you're going to be getting into a relationship with or if it's just one person, they may have had past behaviors that maybe weren't the best. Um, like veto power, for example, or say one partner gets really involved with the secondary and is starting to fall in love. And then, you know, the the primary pulls the rug out from underneath that relationship. Like right. that is a red flag. And then you can kind of figure out the pros and cons of potentially entering into a situation like that while mm-hmm. knowing like, hey, this could be another thing that could happen to me. And I have to be prepared for that. Mm-hmm. Mm, I think. Um, along those lines of what Emily was saying with, you know, kind of asking about past behavior or past experiences, um, especially if you are someone who is who is starting to date a couple. Yeah. Um, if that couple talks a lot about 
having like a really hard time finding someone or you know having a really hard time getting people to stick around or like ha- mm-hmm. you know complaining about other unicorns or about other you know thirds that they've added um, right. that should definitely be something to give you a little bit of pause cuz generally there's mm-hmm. a reason behind it and it's not just because you know the mm-hmm. third every third they picked was a loser <laughs> yeah. you know it's it right. takes two to tango or in this case three to tango <laughs> um yes so <laughs> you know that can actually be that can actually be telling yeah yeah definitely so before we go into talking about some things that you can do if you already find yourself in one of these sorts of difficult situations or maybe you're like i'm not sure if i vetted these guys well enough before we get into all of that we want to take a second um to talk about uh, a few ways that you can help support our show um i actually would like to start by talking about socks is that cool with you guys (laughs) Yeah, so, well, hang on, because your you're so excited. Normally, we're super excited about the Patreon, but you're like so passionate about these socks I just, that I guess we got to give you the airtime. I know. I, I just, wish we could show you guys <laughs> how excited Jess got about these freaking socks. It was, no, it was like 20 minutes before the show <laughs> that we were sitting, like looking at. I was screen with them while I'm at looking the socks. at Bombas socks. All right, so this is <laughs> Bombas socks. It's B O M B A S. Uh, if you want to use our promo code, I'll just tell you this right now. It's getbombus.com slash multiamory. Uh, if you go to that link, getbombus.com slash multiamory, we'll have that on our show description as well if you forget it and want to look it up. Um, you get, you give them your email and you get 20% off your first order. I just did it right now before the show. Uh, so he was so excited by so all, exci- the, I was, yeah, all the many got some really pretty by pretty how socks. many choices there were. I was really grateful that I had <laughs> Emily and Dedeker there to help me choose which of these socks. And I ended up getting yeah. this like eight pack that had some like calf socks and some ankle socks in these cool bright colors. Anyway, super awesome. Love it. Also, what's really cool is that for every pair of socks that they sell, they also donate a pair of socks to homeless shelters around the U.S. Um, and what's really neat about it, too, is that the socks that they donate are not just like they donate the shitty socks and you buy the good socks. <laughs> Um, but they actually have specifically, they specifically, they donate your old socks. <laughs> yeah. You send them your old socks yeah. and they send them to, that no, it's, they specifically sad. developed socks for the homeless population. And what that means yeah. is that they're made out of dark colors, uh, so that they last longer, you know, look better without washing them. They have an antimicrobial coating on them. So they get less smelly and less gross, even if they're not being washed as often and they're also reinforced stitching like all of their socks are so that they're going to last longer. Uh, really yeah. cool. And uh, you get 20% off of some fucking bomb-ass socks. Dedeker keeps pronouncing it bomb-ass instead of bombas. Well, uh, <laughs> so it's bomb Isn't that what they're trying to imply? I mean, when I see these socks, I do want to describe them as bomb-ass. Like, it's bomb-ass. accurate. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, go check that out at oh, getbombus.com slash multiamory for 20% off your first order. Um, also, our Patreon. This is something we talk about every week, and it's because it's fucking amazing. Our Patreon community is incredible. Just, uh, I guess, a week and a half ago, we had our amazing yeah. online discussion group with our $9 and up patrons. Uh, really, really great discussion. Um, you guys rock. Yeah, we have amazing discussions. Like, there's one going on right now about some really heavy stuff, but in a really supportive way in our patron-only Facebook group. Uh, go check that out. It's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, dot com slash multiamory if you want to help contribute to our show and become more involved in that community of other really thoughtful and uh, supportive people out there we really appreciate it the thing and like the last thing i want to point out about patreon is the fact that because now we have our little patreon community that we're so connected to Mm -hmm. like our patrons now have direct influence in helping to craft our show yeah for one of the things that (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes. For example, this, this topic, very topic we're covering today yeah. was because of our patron Kenzie. She specifically requested this during our group discussion and yeah. wanted us to cover this. So here it is. <laughs> and thank you so because yeah, so the things three like of us that. had an amazing conversation before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, both in the discussion this. group and in the in the private Facebook group, just such yeah. amazing discussions that are so inspiring to us and really gives us such great ideas for episodes and be able and it enables us to be able to give like really specific, good, useful advice and be able to know what it is that people are looking for. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's been so great. And thank it. you to those of you that have contributed already. Yes. 
All right, thank you so much. Now let's get back into this. So you don't want to talk about socks a second time. <laughs> I, I kind of do. You're not that excited. I just buy all the socks. You know what? We'll wait until I get my socks in the mail, and then we'll see. That's if, true. Okay. Then but I'll do it again. Uh, then I'm going to want to talk about them more because I'm pretty yeah. okay, freaking stoked good. about these socks. I've also been in need of good <laughs> socks. I bought some socks recently that have not been satisfactory, so I'm excited mm, for these actual I know. good socks. I feel your pain. I feel your pain. Yeah, unsatisfactory socks are the worst. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Anyway. All right, on to antibiotics. <laughs> okay, so yeah, so we we're called this antibiotics. We're talking about the pharmaceutical companies in America. No, we're not. Uh, Thank okay. God. So yeah, so basically, if you are already a secondary, you know, whether you're a secondary to an established couple or you're a secondary, you know, dating somebody who already has a primary, um, we also wanted to give you advice, you know, if you're past the preventative stage, <laughs> maybe you're in a great, a great relationship where you're a secondary, or maybe it's not so great. Want to talk about the things that you can do when you're already in this established relationship to kind of make your experience better and to take care of yourself yeah uh so the first part is kind of related to what we covered before i don't want to spend a ton of time on it but it's basically just this idea of going in with your eyes open um you know not burying your head in the sand and understanding what the risks are of dating someone who is in a hierarchical relationship or of dating a couple that's primary with each other um, is those things of maybe they have different expectations of you than you have. Maybe, you know, you're not allowed to have feelings for either of them or you're not allowed yeah. to see them when it's not convenient for both of them. Or, you know, there's, there's lots of these things that we've talked about on other episodes of our show, like on our adding a third episode, which is more from the point of view of the couple. But for you as the secondary, this is also your responsibility to... Do some reading, listen to some podcasts. Um, you know, I've definitely talked to people who discovered our podcast while going through a hard time mm -hmm. in a triad type of relationship and being like, damn, I wish I had known about some of this stuff sooner because uh, yeah. then I could have seen some of the warning signs that maybe I didn't before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now... So I, wa I want to... Yeah. yeah, I think Jace... I was raised being taught that codependent is like the, a dirty word, like it was a four letter oh, me, word in my me household. Too. Me too. Um, so I don't even want to say the word. Like I just said the word codependent, and I like my ass twitched a little bit. Um, so I'm gonna let I'm gonna let, sorry I'm gonna let Jace talk about this yeah, one. I go think. for it. Well, right. Okay. So so this I, I feel like I'm almost jumping ahead by going to this. But so say you're you're dating a couple, you're dating this person, and you start feeling like you need more from them, whether it's more time or more affection or more something. And they're not able or not willing to give it to you, either because they already have these prescriptive hierarchical rules of the amount of nights that they need to spend with a partner or not taking trips with someone else or something like that, right? Um, or, or even just the fact that they have a house or maybe a family together. So... This is is can be a really difficult situation for you as the secondary if you do feel like you need those things. And I think that this is an opportunity to reflect and look inward and say, you know, what is it that I wish I was getting? And is this the only place I could be getting it? Or am I being codependent? Just like people can do, you know, say you're dating someone mm -hmm. and you start wanting more than they have to offer you, whether it's their time or yeah. their affection or, or money or whatever it is, is just, are you being codependent in feeling like this is the only place I could get this because it's the only thing I have right now or it's where I'm putting all my energy and I'm focused on the fact that I'm not getting these things that I want? Or am I thinking about what are the things I want? Are there other ways I can be getting them fulfilled? Whether it's other yeah, partners so or from myself or my own recreation or from my friends or something. Um, this isn't obviously like a cure all, but it is at least something to think about and say like, well, how much of this is maybe me, ex you know, wanting something that maybe I could be getting somewhere else. It's a good opportunity to look inward Mm -hmm. And kind of, yeah, figure that out for yourself. And I don't know, maybe try to find a relationship that would give that to you and mm -hmm. recognize the one that you're in for what it is and be grateful for those great things that are about it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to pick this one up. Yeah, do it. Do it. And transition us to the next one. And I mean, I feel weird about that advice because I do feel that for a long time, 
the prevailing attitude towards secondaries has been like, well, if you have a complaint, either you leave or you need to just go find your own primary relationship. Mm -hmm. And not to say that like going and finding your own primary relationship is not is necessarily a bad thing. That actually may be exact like perfect. You know, that may be mm-hmm. exactly what it is that you need. Um that you go and seek kind of your own primary ish relationship, but then you're still able to kind of, you know, be secondary and be fulfilled in this secondary relationship. Mm-hmm. Um however, I think that, you know, because that has so often been the advice to secondaries, that it is very easy for secondaries to kind of lose sight of what it is that they should want from their relationships, what it is that they should expect. And it can be very easy for someone who's in a secondary relationship to to quickly forget about just like your basic human rights within a relationship mm-hmm. or just basic human civility or even just being treated like a human being and not yeah. as a function. Yeah. Um, I think human decency know, Franklin, is maybe a better way to put it than human rights, even though I know Franklin Vo puts it as the secondary yeah, yeah, yeah. bill of rights. Bill of rights. But, yeah. 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 yeah which, which will link to the secondary bill of rights, you know, which Franklin Vo wrote, gosh, what, probably like 15 years ago, 10 years ago at a yeah, time when it was, really when it was beautiful. very, we're very controversial to actually think that a secondary would have any rights whatsoever. Right. Um, yeah. But I mean, there's a reason why he wrote that is because that mm-hmm. was the attitude for so long was like secondaries are just lucky to be even be around. Like they should just count their lucky stars that the primary is even allowing them to exist. Right. And they shouldn't, you know, they shouldn't complain about anything else outside of that. And it, it kind of, it dehumanizes the secondary, so, in my opinion. So, Dedeker, let's actually get down to some actual brass tacks Oh, here. let's get down. Let's brass get, tacks. let's get, right? so what pop are, out those brass tacks, baby. Right, like, so what are these? Like, what are some particular things that you think people should be aware of in terms of, of their own rights or just basic human decency that they should expect? Um, what comes to mind, I don't have the secondary bill of rights pulled up, and so mm-hmm. I'm just going to pull from my own, kind of my own inner bill of rights that I that I have about this. What comes to mind is something like, I think that it's your right within a relationship to expect some kind of alone time, for instance. Okay. Um, you know, to expect some kind of one-on-one time, you know, that, that your time spent with a particular partner is not always going to be in a group setting or not always going to be in a setting where the primary partner is there. That I think that's a basic right that you mm-hmm. should expect um, for a relationship. What do you guys think? I think you should have the right to specific needs and the right to have them be fulfilled at times. It, uh, I'm not saying every single need has to be fulfilled at all times, especially if they potentially are not going to be, you know, realistically met. But mm-hmm. if you say like, hey, I want the opportunity for emotional intimacy with you to some degree, I think that that can be a compromise or a thing that can be met by a partner. Absolutely. I think- I think to kind of build on that, that like you should at least feel that you have the ability to ask for something. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. L- yeah. 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 I mean, that's human mm. decency right there. Yeah. That you, sh- right. you should at least be able to ask for your needs to be fulfilled. Yeah. It, right. And to be able to be involved in that conversation. I, I would say a big one that that comes up a lot for me is is sort of a human decency thing of that any plans made with you will be honored to the best of their Mm. ability. Um, Meaning Mm -hmm. if we have plans already and then your partner just feels jealous or is having a bad day, you're not going to cancel your plans. If it's not not an emergency. Right. If it's, and we all understand that like, it's not going to be perfect a hundred percent of the time. But if this is an ongoing thing where your time and commitments made to you are not being respected, like that is, perhaps a boundary that you should set for yourself. And that might be an indicator that this is not a relationship that you should continue. Yeah. Mm. Which brings us to our next topic of boundaries. Um, So that's, that's an example of one Um, meaning, you know, boundaries are not something that you put on someone else. Boundaries are something that you have for yourself. Meaning, right. Like I'm, I have a boundary for myself that I'm not, I'm not going to put myself in a situation where I'm in a relationship with someone that doesn't honor their commitments to me, whatever those mm-hmm. may be, um, you know, that, yeah. that consistently doesn't doesn't honor those. Yeah. Uh, so that's an example of a boundary that it's not saying like you're a bad person for doing that or I'm punishing you by breaking up or I'm going to threaten you with breaking up. But just honestly, for me, like that's something that's going to upset me and not a situation that I want to 
put myself in and, and continue to let myself be in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can you guys think of any other ones that, that come to mind in terms of being a secondary with a, with a couple like that? Or with a person in a primary relationship? In terms of an antibiotic or what? In terms of a... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. You're taking the metaphor so far. Yeah. No, in terms of a boundary. In terms of a boundary. Oh, a boundary. You, of just kind of... You know, we talked about human decency and sort of your rights. And that's kind of tends to frame it in terms of what you would expect from someone um, else. But what is it that you need for yourself? I want to... Uh, I think I would want to be able to like speak about my insecurities and allow for a a safe space for not only my partner to speak about their insecurities, but potentially the metamor to be able to speak about their insecurities Mm. as well, which Mm. I think kind of leads into the next, the next thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, But Dedeker, you can go next if you want. (laughs) My boundary that I was going to offer actually does lead into the next thing, but it's Mm kind of like I have a boundary around decisions being made about like my relationship life and my sex life mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. By as in like else. i want to, well i want yeah like i want to be the autonomous one who's able to make empowered decisions about those things sure um, and so that manifests in two ways you know the first way being that like if a couple has a veto rule like i probably will not get involved with either with a couple or with one half of the couple because mm-hmm. like that's taking away my power to make a decision about a relationship and putting it in someone else's hands um, yeah right the other way it manifests is um kind of like how we mentioned at the beginning like if it's decided that by dating someone that means i also am by default dating their other partner um again that's been a decision that's been made for me ahead of time you know like i didn't get the choice to like organically create a relationship with this person it was just kind of forced upon me sure um, yeah yeah and but however, <laughs> that doesn't mean that you can't have any kind of relationship with your metamor. You know, if you're in a in a relationship right now where you're a secondary, we actually encourage you to reach out to your metamor, to reach out to that person who is primary to your yeah. partner and try to get on good terms with them. Um, we don't recommend forcing any kind of sexual or romantic relationship if you don't want it. If you do want it, like great and see where that goes but if you don't want it you shouldn't feel any kind of compulsion or pressure to do that um Mm -hmm. but as we've talked about on many episodes past you know connecting to your metamors can be awesome and great and especially if you're in a situation where the primary couple has kind of more power than you do it can be good to humiliate yourself to the person who holds more yeah it humanizes you to them and vice versa it can make the two of you not feel i don't know so potentially insecure about one another well, um, and it kind of is like, you're human, I recognize you as that, and you can do the same for me. Yeah, mm-hmm. so this mm-hmm. this this goes into one of our, uh, I think our last thing here is just about the importance of connecting with your metamorphs. Uh, that, say you are entering into a relationship with someone and they have a primary partner, having some kind of communication with that, with that other partner, with your metamorph, is really important because they obviously are this very important primary relationship with the person that you're dating Um, and this also for me ties into boundaries that we we were just talking about is if i'm dating someone and i say oh i'd like to meet your partner or you know maybe like let's all go out to some social thing i'd like to meet them there if i'm dating someone and they're like oh no like i don't want you to meet them like or they don't want to meet you to me that's a big red flag and for me is is a boundary that i'd be like okay like man i you know i've really like you but i can't continue a relationship with someone who needs to hide me from from mm-hmm. their partner like that from someone yeah. close to them mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. but hopefully that relationship can be a really positive thing and then helps it so when things do come up you can all talk about it instead of yeah. someone having that temptation to unilaterally decide something about another relationship yeah mm-hmm. yeah um, all right great so Wow, so that was a whirlwind. Now of closing stuff. prayer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a lot, but uh, hopefully it was helpful to some of you or to all of you. Yeah, I mean this is yeah, it's, it's yeah. such a common thing in the yeah, polyamory world, is. and there's a lot of people uh, who really like being that secondary partner for other really, people. Yeah, they do. Right, absolutely. And 
at the same time, a lot of the people I know who still really like it have also been in a lot of really shitty situations because of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, well, there's something there clearly for people. So hopefully some of these things will give people stuff to think about in terms of how to make those as good as possible and as positive as possible. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And then also to help, you know, if you're dating a couple who actually knows less about Polly than you, or maybe hasn't done this kind of education, it might be your opportunity to be the one educating them instead of assuming that they're the ones with all of the power and all of the knowledge uh, to educate you about how it's going to go. So I hope this is helpful. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Where can they find us? uh, If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at info at multiamory.com. You can visit our website, multiamory.com. You can tweet at us uh, at Multiamory on Twitter. Find us on Facebook, uh, Instagram, Multiamory underscore podcast. We're all over the place. We love to hear from you. We love getting you involved in the conversation. Uh, And if you really want to get involved with the amazing community we have, check out patreon.com slash Multiamory. All right, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. See you later, bye. Bye. See ya. Hey, this is Dan Savage from the Savage Lovecast and Savage Love, and you're listening to a Swing Set podcast at Swing Set FM.